Welcome everyone to the Inside Java Newscast, where we cover recent developments in the OpenJDK community. I'm Nikolai Parlock, Java developer at Forget Oracle, and today I got two topics for you. First, five secret Java API tips, and second, the semantics of records. Ready? Then let's dive right in. Gunnar Morling, software engineer at Red Hat, recently asked on Twitter for people's secret Java API tip methods or classes that are really helpful, but maybe not that well known. The replies were great, and I wanted to show you a few here. I linked to Gunnar's tweet and all the other ones in the description below, so you can give them a little laugh if you want to. Now, how do we do this? An obvious approach would be to present the ones that got the most likes. But then I'd have to show you Lucas Eda's reply, and I really don't want to. So instead, I just pick what I like best. Links to the relevant documentation in the description as well. If you have a stream of strings and a regular expression in form of a pattern instance, then how do you filter the strings that match the pattern? Or determine whether at least one or even all of the strings match the regex? The stream API has methods for that. Filter, any match, all match, but they all take a predicate. And that's basically the answer. Pattern has a method as predicate, which returns a predicate of string that you can use in situations like this. Very handy. Staying on the topic of regular expressions, did you know that Java supports named capturing groups? I didn't. To create a normal unnamed capturing group, you'll put that part of the regular expression in parentheses, right? You can then later reference it by its index that you pass to matcher's group method. But you can also reference groups by name. There's an overload for matcher group that takes a string. How do you give a group a name though? Easy. Just put it into angle brackets, prepend that with a question mark, and put that whole thing after the group's opening parentheses. Not exactly beautiful, but regular expressions really are. What I really like about that is that it's documentation in code. I imagine that understanding a regex with named groups is a bit easier than without. Here's my entry to the list. Predicate static method not. It takes a predicate and returns a new one that is the negation. This might seem unnecessary. Can't you just invert the boolean expression that created the predicate in the first place? Yes. But then that expression needs to be in the lambda, so you can sneak in the exclamation mark and I like method references more. Say you have a stream of strings and want to filter out the empty ones. So you call stream filter. Either with a lambda, like string, arrow, exclamation mark, string dot is empty, or after static input of predicate not, with the method reference not string is empty. I prefer the second. My colleague, Jose Pomar, threw in the static method comparator natural order. That's a really good one if a generic container needs a comparator, like list sort does, and the parametric type is already comparable. Calling natural order will then return a comparator that simply uses the comparables compare to method. Wow, that was a lot of compare. Beyond passing that on directly, natural order is also a great starting point for the many other methods on comparator, which has a lot more to offer. Whether it's reversing or chaining comparators or making them null safe, comparator has a method for you. Okay, we had some fun, now let's talk about safety. The stream interface extends auto-closable, which means you can use it in a try with resources block. And there are cases where you have to. When using the streams returned by files list or files lines, for example, the methods javadoc always mentions when you have to close the return stream, but there's also a really helpful blog post by Mike Kowalski, a software engineering consultant and blogging member of the Java community, where he goes into more detail and lists all the methods where this is necessary, I'll link it in the description, and while you're there, check out more of his posts, for example, the one on why you can't afford to run on Java 8. That was it for Java API tips. I'm looking forward to read yours in the comments. Now let's talk records. With records leaving preview in Java 16, more and more developers are experimenting with it, which is great. Reading various blog posts and observing or participating in conversations all around the internet made me realize, though, that there's a common misunderstanding about this feature that I want to clear up. You should know records a bit to get the most out of what follows. I'll link a good explanation below. So here it comes. Ready? Records are not about avoiding boilerplate. If they were, I'm sure a number of design decisions would have come out differently. No, records are not about that. Although they do have that very welcome property as well. At the core of records isn't boilerplate, it's tuples. Nominal tuples. Let me explain. Say you have an integer. Now take another one and put the two side by side. There you go, that's a tuple. Assuming that you don't hide any of the two from the outside world and that there's a clear way to create the tuple from two integers. Now let's talk Java code. To write a class for that tuple, it needs two integer fields. 
two accessors for them, and a constructor that accepts two integers and assigns them to the fields. It would also be nice if the tuple 00, 0 would equal another tuple 00, 0, so an equals implementation would be welcome. And once we have that, we need to implement hash code as well. And since we need all that, fields, accessors, constructor equals hash code, and there's a good default implementation for each, the compiler might as well generate it and throw in toString for good measure. So you can see, alleviating us of boilerplate code is a consequence of records being tuples, and that they're tuples is also the reason for their restrictions. For example, we can't remove an accessor, change its name or return type, and shouldn't change the value it returns because then the record is no longer a tuple. The motto is, the API for a record models the state, the whole state and nothing but the state. And that comes with a number of benefits. One of them is the reduction of boilerplate. Another is that serialization works much better. If you're interested in more on that, by the way, uh, check out the Inside Java podcast episode 14. Other benefits are record suitability for pattern matching and other language features. There's much more to this, and if you want to understand a bit about the mathematical foundation, how records are different from, for example, Lombok's data and value annotations or Kotlin's data classes, and what features we'll build on top of them, you'll be glad to hear I've just written a blog post about that that I'll link in the description. And that's it for today on the Inside Java Newscast. If you have any questions about what I covered in this episode, ask Ed in the comments. And if you enjoy this kind of content, help us spread the word with a like or by sharing this video with your friends and colleagues. I see you again in two weeks. So long! Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. Do it now. The video is over anyways.